We just learned about balanced communication. Now we want to look at some further patterns of what effective organizational communicators do. We're going to call this supportive communication. And in this segment, you're going to learn about six supportive communication behaviors. And also you're going to see some data as to why supportive communication is so critical for effective organizational outcomes. We're going to go specifically into each of these things, people oriented, not person oriented, descriptive, not evaluative, et cetera, et cetera. But before we do, I want you to look at this. This is why supportive or assertive communication is so important. Look at this, um, what this study says um, uh, from 2013. Research has shown that organizations that foster supportive communication among their members are more productive, are more effective at problem solving, produce higher quality outcomes, and have fewer conflicts in organizations than do, that, than do not have supportive communication, okay? Again, this seems like soft skill stuff, but it's th this is the stuff that has real bottom line impact. So let's take uh, problem orientation versus person orientation first, okay? First, we wanna talk about false attribution error. False attribution error is this. If I am late to work, I attribute it to external circumstances. I was late to work because uh, traffic was crazy because I was, I was up so late preparing this webinar uh, and because um, my kid is sick. If you are late to work, I attribute it to your being lazy, to your being uh, unprepared for work or apathetic about your job. This is, so in other words, I start focusing on you the person in a difficult conversation than a problem. Okay, the problem is you coming late to work. So the false attribution error happens all the time. You see the problem where I say, oh, for myself I give excuses, but let's say you're my employee and I just assume, I just attribute it falsely potentially to your being lazy, to yours not being external circumstances, but to being part of your character. You can see why this would create conflict. Right, and, and and the reason this is such a challenge is it is easier to change someone's behavior than someone's personality. Focus on behavior you want to see change rather than well you're a real jerk so let's change that. That that is not going to be productive. Okay, so here's an example of what we mean instead of what we want to say is hey let's work together Dan on improving our work or or making sure that we're all more punctual. What I say instead is well your laziness is the real problem with our team. Not going to go well. Okay, common sense, and yet you hear people communicate using the uh, false attribution error, focusing on people instead of problems, okay? What do we mean by descriptive versus evaluative? Well, kind of the same thing. What we want to be is very specific as opposed to general. And what I mean by that is we want to um, say, um, Dan, your, your last four reports have been riddled with spelling errors, as opposed to, Dan, you're a terrible writer, right? You see, what we, we want to be descriptive and not evaluative. evaluative. We want to avoid, um, e one, I'm being specific and I'm describing their reports, and one, I'm evaluating their capacity as a writer, okay? Um, we want to avoid either or statements saying, if this doesn't, get, and, and think about this in terms of being general, if this doesn't get fixed, uh, I don't know, something's going to have to happen. Well, unless you're absolutely willing to back that up, um, it just sounds passive aggressive, okay? And, and you don't want to get yourself in, in, in a corner like, th look, like this lady, this husband said to her wife, either the cat goes or I do, so she puts an ad out saying for either the cat or the husband saying, okay, well, let's see who goes then. Um, we, we want to avoid those kind of either or statements, right? We want to uh, communicate in objective and verifiable terms. I can show them their last three reports and I can define for them the specific spelling errors. I can verify that, can't I? That That is different than, oh, you're just a bad writer. And once, I, I, once I've given them a label, um, that, 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 that creates unnecessary conflict. That creates problems for people. They don't want to have those labels, okay? Um, lazy, bad writer, um, I, I don't know, terrible employee, yeah, I don't know, what, whatever labels might be there. So I want to tell someone, you've been late three times this week, instead of, so Dan, what did you do? What did you do? When did you become such a terrible employee? Right? I just labeled that person a terrible employee instead of saying, "No, the problem is you've been late three times this week. You were late on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday." Okay? That th this is the kind of thing that we're trying to avoid, right? If you and I are going to have a sort of supportive communication and balance our our difficult conversations effectively. 
The next is conjunctive versus disjunct disjunctive. I, I love this because you see it in passive communicators all the time, right? Um, statements should be relevant to the primary conversation purpose. In other words, it, it should conjoin with what it is that you've been discussing. What I mean by that is it would be very easy, um, let's say you and I are discussing your uh, reports. If I'm a bad communicator, the, the spelling errors in your reports, and I did not want to have this conversation, and let's say you get defensive. So instead of saying, I'm going to keep this conversation focused on the reports, let's say I start going, uh, you know, another problem, Dan, is that these conversations with you are terrible because you always get so defensive. All of a sudden, this conversation has become disjunctive, and instead of keeping it focused on, I wanted to give them feedback and, and, and the spelling to improve on the reports they've been writing, all of a sudden now we have opened up a whole can of worms. Maybe I do feel that way about having conversations, or maybe you do feel that way about having conversations with me and giving me feedback because it always is so unpleasant. But that you you bet you need to be prepared for that conversation, or it needs to be a separate conversation. Does that make sense? And if you are going to move on, if you are going to sort of take a, a a shot at me from left field, you need to both parties need to agree. At least it, it needs to be implied that we are moving on from the spelling errors in the reports. It can't just be part of this 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 morass of 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 of, of negativity and and of of attacks. Does that make sense? Um, if you're going to talk to me about the reports, let's talk about that, and when we've resolved that, then we can move on. Don't just be like, and another thing about you, simply because the conversation has gone sour. Um, keeping things conjunctive and relative and focused on what it is you want to communicate uh, allows us to have a, a better chance at re resolution. So it's, it's you and I communicating like, well, then let me build on something you said there about the reports and, and the difficulty you've been having, as opposed to, Dan, your reports are bad, and you know what? I hate having these conversations with you because you're so manipulative. Lots of problems there. I've labeled you there, right? Going back to what we've just talked about, um, I've been uh, demeaning, uh, we, which is what we want to talk about next. We want to we want to be validating in our assertive and supportive conversations, not demeaning. Uh, we want to avoid demeaning phrases. Um, wow, you're really lazy. Okay. Um, when did you become such a crappy employee? You know, all the examples I've been using. A validating conversation is characterized by respectful conversation uh, but, and, and flexibility. Okay, Dan, you, you say um, you've been late three times um, because of your schedule. Let, let's talk about your schedule then, right? You want to validate someone in, the communi in your communication, in your difficult conversation, so that future interactions, and think about the task relationship balance, that the future relationship is also positive, right? You, you want to give it every chance you can to, 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 to salvage the professional relationship. Word choice matters here, okay? Uh, Nonverbal considerations matter here. We're what I'm talking about is tone. Are you using a respectful tone? a validating tone, or are you being sarcastic with them? Are you being condescending with them, right? So I, so let's say you and I disagree. Well, I could be demeaning about that, or I could say, look, I, I, under, I understand your point, Gary, even if I see it differently. I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I understand what you're saying. Or I could say, well, you know, I don't agree with you, but you've never been promoted to a manager, so, you know, I don't expect you to understand. Man, you have that is not going to be a successful conversation, okay? And in fact, this person is not going to want to have these conversations with you again in the future because of that kind of approach, because of that kind of condescension and, and demeaning nature, right? So we're moving through things here uh, quickly, but again, uh, the 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 slides and of course the the. Uh, Webinar itself will be available to you uh, on the Employee Gateway. So what, what's our next thing here? What about owned versus disowned? I love this one too, and this is another one you see very often with, with very passive or passive uh, aggressive communicators. Own your words and actions. If you are giving someone feedback about their performance, you need to say, Dan, I do not like the way your reports have been written the past three weeks. Dan, it is n I do not think it is okay for you to be late three times in a week. Let me, give you an, let me give you an example of a disowned conversation. Let's say um, you were on, your boss was part of the hiring team for a promotion that you did not get. 
and the person that owns it says, well, let me tell you why I think you didn't, let me tell you why you didn't get it, right, or we denied your application, instead of someone saying, well, they've decided to deny your application, or, you know what, the, they, the committee didn't give you the promotion, or, you know what, they didn't give you a promotion because X, Y, and Z, or they, they always are blaming things or, or attributing the, the, the um, decision-making to someone else, and sometimes even a completely vague, nebulous they, you know, well, you know, the higher-ups just didn't think you had the stuff for this job. What? Who's the higher-ups in this case, right? You want, you want to own it, okay? And here's why, because disown conversations inhibit strong interpersonal relationships. First reason is because mostly I can sense, for lack of a better term, the BS. I can sense weakness from you. I can sense that you are being passive and hiding behind sort of this vague they, and it makes me lose respect for you. I, I will am much more likely to have respect for the person who says, well, Dan, let me tell you why I think you didn't get the job, okay? Uh, and also, it just it just distances us, okay? As opposed to building a relationship of trust, it distances us, and, and so that's why um, it, it's problematic, okay? Uh, the, the last thing we want to talk about here is that these conversations are two-way versus one-way, and if you're going to have a two-way difficult conversation, you have to plan for it. It has to be sought out. In fact, I bet some of you right now listening are saying, if I have these difficult conversations with my staff, it will not be two-way. Some of them will pout. They will just go, well, whatever, you're the boss, so, and they will sort of throw that kind of, they'll try and sort of stilt the, any conversation, real conversation. What you need to do is either beforehand tell them to come prepared to discuss things, tell them you will expect them to, or don't give in. Don't let them off the hook by saying, by doing all the talking. Be willing to stand some silence and say, well, Dan, I, I need to hear what your thoughts are on this, and I want to, you know, hear what you have to say. You need to seek that out, right? And the second, the second you seek that out and you persist, you need to be willing to actively listen. Now, we could do a whole webinar on active listening, right? But active listening, uh, described briefly here is this. It's mindful listening, meaning you're actually saying, I'm going to try and see where they're coming from. You suspend judgment initially. The hardest thing, one of the biggest barriers to communication is our, our knee-jerk reaction, reaction to evaluate, not just what's being said, but the person who's saying it, right? Think about that. Uh, communications experts say, yeah, what happens all the time in these conversations is you and I immediately jump to evaluation. Even if we don't tell them that, we just, in our minds, we're going, oh, this person is so full of crap. Or, oh my gosh, this person is just a whiner. We need to suspend judgment, right? Resist distractions. Don't let other things bother you. Don't be checking your email. Wait before responding. You may want to jump in immediately to someone that you're actively listening to and tell them, no, 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 here's the point. You may have something brilliant to say, but the second you do, you're not actively listening. And then clarify how you see things, how you interpret what they're saying. Don't simply regurgitate or repeat what they're saying back to you as a gimmick or a technique. Okay? I, I, I've had an opportunity recently to, to work with a very well-published, uh, well-credentialed organizational leadership expert, and, and I love this phrase that he used. He said, Active listening is squinting with your ears, okay? It's squinting with your ears. So think about when you're trying to read something, you're trying to, under, and you squint to see something better, maybe in the distance. Active listening is squinting, but with your ears. That kind of even physical manifestation of you saying, I really need to get to what this person is truly saying, that's active listening. Not easy to do, but if you and I are going to have those uh, two-way versus one-way conversations, it's going to help us to have supportive communication.